Hello, I'm Paul Walker, Medical Oncologist, Circular Gene. I would like to welcome you to another case presentation in our ongoing Circular Gene Molecular Tumor Board series. Today's case illustrates the evolving understanding and clinical utility of utilizing liquid biopsies with plasma next generation sequencing to monitor for developing mechanistic resistant pathway mutations, then guiding a change away from an ineffective therapy to a more effective therapy to achieve ongoing disease control. Neither serum tumor markers or circulating tumor cells were able, ever able to achieve that. Now it is clear that circulating tumor DNA can. The PATA-1 study was a seminal proof of principle of exactly that. ESR1 mutations are associated with aromatase inhibitor resistance. In this particular study, patients being treated with an AI and a CDK4-6 inhibitor were monitored for the development of ESR1 mutations in circulating tumor DNA. When developed, patients were randomized to either continuing the AI and CDK4-6 inhibitor or being switched to a selective estrogen receptor to greater fulvestrin and continue the CDK4-6 inhibitor. In this particular study, when the ESR1 mutation was identified in plasma ctDNA and there was a switch away from an AI to fulvestrin with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, there was a prolonged progression-free survival. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve. Pa patients switched to fulvestrin away from the AI when the ESR1 developed had a median progression-free survival of 12 months. When the AI was continued in the face of developing ESR1 mutations indicating resistance to the AI, the progression-free survival was in half just at six months. And there was no increased toxicity in changing away from an ineffective to an effective therapy. In this particular case, this is a 71-year-old female with bone, pleuropulmonary, and lymph nodal metastatic ER positive breast cancer being treated with an AI alone. A liquid biopsy, plasma, and GS was obtained, which revealed an ESR1 D538G mutation, as well as a sensitive PIC3 E545K mutation. However, looking at the mutant allele fraction to the right on the slide, the MAF of the ESR1 mutation was 16%, whereas on the PIC3 mutation, it was only 1.14%. This clearly indicates that the ESR1 was the dominant resistant pathway in this particular patient. As a quick review, there are three anti-estrogen therapeutic approaches. One is an aromatase inhibitor, which limits the peripheral conversion of testosterone to estrogen. Second is tamoxifen, a selective estrogen receptor modulator binding to the receptor. And third is selective estrogen receptor degraders. Fulvestrin is what we have in clinical use today, and this will actually degrade and downregulate the estrogen receptor. The ESR1 mutation encodes estrogen receptor alpha. When it is wild type to, to, the, to the left, all therapeutic interventions of anti-estrogen will be effective. However, when there is a mutation in the ESR1, and in this particular case, it was a D538G in the ligand binding pocket, this prevents the estrogen, the fist, into the, into the palm from happening, and this will this will decrease the affinity for estrogen, SERMs, and to some degree, even selective estrogen receptor degraders. It will then activate the cancer with increased proliferation, survival, and migration, and AI resistance. This is just a schematic looking at the ESR1 mutations, and that's on, on the right. The AI will be ineffective. The selective estrogen receptor downregulators and modulators will be somewhat effective as the surge more so than SERMs. And CDK4-6 inhibitors will be effective irrespective of the ESR1 wild tab type or mutation status. In, in the PATA-1 study, it was noted that across all subsets of patients, except with bony only disease, there was a benefit of switching away from the AI to fulvestrin, continuing the CDK4-6 inhibitor, as opposed to continuing on with an ineffective therapy in the face of a known resistant pathway. 
A second study in, in this year was really also a, a huge step forward in management ES, managing ESR1 mutations. The, the Emerald trial was looking at elasochant, which is an oral selective estrogen receptor degrader versus just standard of care, whether fulvestrin or other standard of care with or without ESR1 mutations. When there was an ESR1 mutation in the circulating tumor DNA in the plasma, then there was a comparison of the elasochant, the oral SERD versus fulvestrin, the intramuscular SERD. All patients did have prior CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. And if you look at the progression-free survival in the ESR mutation patients, if they were were treated with fulvestrin, the 12-month progression-free survival was only 8%, whereas if they were they were treated with elasochant, the oral SERD, it was 28%. This is looking at the overall survival in the ESR1 mutated patients determined by circulating tumor DNA, and there was an overall survival improvement in addition to the progression-free survival in this particular setting. Again, CDK4-6 inhibitor re resistant prior treatment, but we also know that when the ESR mutation subset of patients, CDK4-6 inhibitors can be effective. Another seminal trial from, from this year was subsets of the Monarch 2 trial. And this, this was a study of, of a CDK4-6 inhibitor and, and filvestrin. And when they looked at the ESR1 mutations and the combination of the CDK4-6 and filvestrin in the wild type setting, there was a, a benefit of, of the CDK4-6 inhibitor with filvestrin. And even in the ESR1 mutation subset, there was a benefit of the CDK4-6 inhibitors with filvestrin compared to filvestrin alone. Also in the PIK3 mutation subset of patients, whether wild type or mutation, there was a benefit of CDK4-6 inhibitor plus filvestrin compared to filvestrin alone. And looking at the overall survival in the ESR1 mutation patients, there was a late separation of the curve indicating an overall survival benefit of utilizing filvestrin and a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Even in the PIK3 mutation subset of patients, there was a benefit of a CDK4-6 inhibitor and filvestrin compared to filvestrin alone. A, a, a PIK3 mutation TKI was not utilized in this particular study, but clearly a combination of filvestrin and a CDK4-6 inhibitors is going to be effective in either ESR1 mutation or PIK3 mutation. Now, should you add all three? Should there be a PIK3 TKI, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and, and a selective estrogen receptor down regulator? And the greater than this particular study, looking at, at exactly that, the TKI triplet was not recommended because there was inordinate toxicity. Another very important seminal proof of principle study was published last year in clinical cancer research from Mass General, looking at metastatic breast cancer, then doing parallel both tissue biopsies for molecular testing with NGS, as well as liquid biopsies to assess for plasma next generation sequencing. And two things were very clear from this study. The plasma identified more PIK3 mutations in tissue, and the plasma identified more ESR1 mutations than tissue. So clearly there is an important need upon any recurrence to repeat plasma next generation sequencing because that can identify more and better than tissue can because it can overcome the tissue heterogeneity. But even in the monitoring for resistant pathways, the PADA1 study would indicate there is a benefit of utilizing that because you know in time there will be AI resistance and now can identify that earlier and improve and extend progression-free survival whether with filvestrin and a CDK4-6 inhibitors or, or elasitrant. And even more profound, looking at the overall survival, when the tissue guided the 
therapy. There was no benefit whether standard of care, dealer's choice, or matching a therapy. Whereas in plasma, if plasma is utilized to match the therapy, there was a survival benefit as opposed just to standard of care, dealer's choice, not matching up to the molecular pathways. And I think oncologically that makes sense because the plasma and GS is identify the more aggressive clone and the metastatic clone. And by treating that, then a survival benefit can be achieved. In this particular patient, the breast molecular tumor board recommendations were, number one, obviously discontinue the aromatase inhibitor as there is a clear resistant pathway. The recommendation, given the fact that the patient had not received the CDK4-6 inhibitor thus far, was to switch to a CDK4-6 inhibitor and fulvestrin as a selective estrogen receptor degrader. And then upon any subsequent progression disease, then switch to el elasistrant. But also as a recommendation to repeat the plasma NGS at six to eight weeks to assess for an early ctDNA response. If there is residual dominant ESR1 or PIK3, then that would, that would indicate a different balance and a potentially change if PIK3 is still persisting and the ESR1 is, has been completely cleared, then bringing in a PIK3 TKI would, would be a strong consideration. And it's also important to eat the monitor of plasma NGS because you can identify resistant pathways and certainly upon any symptomatic or radiographic or clinically suspected progression disease, you want to know whether there's a resistant pathway and plasma can identify that better than tissue. HER2 can become amplified over time and certainly pdl one expression can be greatly impacted when it's the presence of a triple negative breast cancer. And as all, all medical oncologists know, breast cancer is a dynamic phenotype and genotype. You can be ER positive in one compartment, HER2 positive in another, and triple negative in, in another. I hope this illustrated the evolving clinical understanding and more importantly, the utility impacting patient outcomes with utilizing liquid biopsies with plasma next generation sequencing in breast cancer and in all cancers because you can identify resistant pathways and then make a change before a patient becomes symptomatic and comes close to a potential malignant terminal cliff. Thank you for your attention.